Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the History of Humankind. Uh, in an earlier episode, I discussed how Sumerian myths influenced later Abrahamic religions, uh, some of the stories that we see in, the gen in Genesis of the Old Testament. Uh, today, I want to go into greater depth about the Sumerian myths, their gods, um, and some of their ritual practices. But as you can see here from this genealogy, uh, their pantheon was quite extensive and very complicated, about 3,000 gods in total. Uh, so we don't have the time to, to explain all of their characteristics, but we will name some of the main ones and look um, at how they um, were patrons of the various city-states. The world really begins with this goddess here, Namu, and we will see how her various offspring um, lead to the creation of man. So Namu was the primordial um, sea goddess. She predates the world. Before her, there is really nothing. So she is creating ex nihilo, um, the world, very similar to the god in uh, Genesis, who brings order to chaos. So Namu is this uh, primordial sea goddess, and she has two very important gods as offspring, An and Ki. An is the god of sky, Ki, the goddess of earth. Be, and which is not surprising because a lot of ancient um, civilizations equated um, earth and uh, the growth of plants with female fertility. So uh, once Namu has uh, An and Ki, earth comes into creation, the world, they had a much narrower conception of the universe, probably um, very uh, geocentric view. And uh, their, their conception of the world was a flat dome um, with Earth as the base. And they probably saw Earth as flat. And the, when they looked up into the sky, they saw a kind of bowl shape. And maybe con uh, attributed the rainfall to this uh, primordial sea above on, above the sky. So the, the offspring of An, they are called Anuna. They are chief gods. Because although there were thousands of gods in their pantheon, uh, and several for each city state, uh, there were, uh, the most important. And, uh, in addition to Anuna, you have the Anunnaki, they are the offspring of An and Ki, um, otherwise known as those from heaven who came to earth. They were seven judges of the underworld. Seven judges of the underworld. And the underworld is a conception that comes around later. It is called Irkala. And it is um, administered by the um, goddess of the underworld known as Oresh Kigal. And she is overseeing these seven judges. And the underworld in Sumerian myth can be considered similar to... Uh, Sheol in Judaism, and um, Hades in the Greek pantheon. And some people suggest that uh, the Greeks took their mythology from earlier Mesopotamian sources, such as this one. Now, this um, underworld is not necessarily a place of pain or pleasure, it's kind of like a limbo where everyone goes regardless of class. In, in ancient Egyptian myth, uh, only the pharaohs 
experience um, the the uh, world beyond. But in Mesopotamian belief, everyone goes to the same place after death, not necessarily a, a place of pain or pleasure, though. So the pantheon of gods, uh, they were anthropomorphic, meaning they took the shape of human beings. Anthropomorphic. They were uh, related. They were filial. And um, they displayed very human-like personalities. Personalities. They could be fickle, emotional, uh, and act on whims, very similar to Zeus and a lot of the gods in the Greek pantheon. Uh, for instance, uh, some of the gods, they rebel um, against the chief gods. They don't want to work. So that is why the uh, gods create man in these clay vessels here. Okay. So they create man in clay vessels as their kind of workforce, as a worker race. Um, but being that they are um, very fickle and display human-like characteristics, they decide they're done with man after a while and they are going to send a cataclysmic flood to kill everyone. But man must have existed for a while between his creation and his uh, destruction because in the Sumerian kings list there are ten leaders before the flood that rule for thousands of years before flood. And the last of these rulers he is called Ziusudra, Ziusudra of Shurupak. And how does he escape the flood? Well, the god Enki, whom we met in an earlier episode, the patron god of Eridu, first city established around 5400 BCE, Enki warns Ziusudra of the um, impending flood and tells him to build an ark with pairs of animals. And this must sound very familiar to anyone um, acquainted with Abrahamic religions. So he is the equivalent of Noah in Genesis. Uh, he also has an equivalent known as Atrahasis in Akkadian belief, um, Utnapishtim, Utnapishtim in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, Gilgamesh goes on a lengthy journey to find this immortal man. Uh, and finally, the Greeks believed in Deucalion and his wife. So all of these different uh, belief systems, myths, probably came from earlier Mesopotamian source. After the flood, uh, which uh, took place around 3000 BCE, um, you know, scholars have found evidence of, of such, you know, cataclysmic flooding. Uh, we enter the early dynastic period and, and it is still at this time that the city states are theocratic. Okay. And the, uh, theocracy is a government ruled by the gods. Theocracy. And they, these theoc this theocracy was, um, administered by high priests named N or NC who were the high priests. Right. And as we saw, the, the gods could be quite fickle, so uh, a priest wielded a lot of power because he could act um, on behalf of man. 
to appease the gods by offer, giving them offerings of fruit and grain, as we see here in the work of Ace. Right, so, uh, but in the pre-dynastic period and even into the early dynastic period, city-states um, are governed by these high priests. The female equivalent was called a nin. She she was a high priestess. Um, and they also uh, lived full time in the temple complexes. Uh, they kept the traditions of the city state alive. Uh, it uh, did administrative work and oversaw the immense amount of uh, collaboration that went into the canal networks and the irrigation. Uh, but later on, we see that uh, the Lugals, the wealthy merchants and military leaders, take control from the priests, and then they become the intermediaries between uh, gods and people. They move a lot of the uh, power to the palaces versus the ziggurats. The, in Eridu, you have raised platform temples, but uh, as time goes on and Lugals become more powerful, the ziggurats develop, step platform, pyramid, and um, with the temple at the top. And this suggested more privacy for the ritual ceremonies, right? So religion went from a very popular uh, egalitarian activity to something more, more private. And uh, it was said that the Lugals cemented their power by having relationships with the Nin or the high priestesses so that they could gain a kind of semi-divine status. And many of the uh, city-states, they had their own patron god. Uh, so, for example, Enlil, who was the god of air, who later became... Um, the chief god, like Zeus, Enlil, god of air, looked after the poor. And then you had Enki, as we said, god of uh, fresh water, male fertility. He oversaw Eridu and lived at the Abzu Temple. If you remember correctly, we said Abzu was the, the freshwater ocean beneath the earth. Um, and then Inanna, we've been acquainted with her several times. She's the goddess of, of warfare and female fertility. She oversaw Oruk. So you can see that uh, each each um, city state uh, had their own patron, and later on, after the Akkadian conquests, um, the the Akkadians, the Babylonians, will adopt many of these these gods into their own pantheon and rename them. So, for instance, Inanna became Ishtar in um, in Babylonian myth. And she was raised to a higher status, as well as uh, Marduk, who was very um, minor in Sumerian belief, but later on in Babylonian belief, he becomes uh, very supreme. In the next episode, we will um, do a, a quick review of everything we have learned so far about the ancient Sumerians. See you then.